。然后我们这一次的讲者是，呃、嗯、，Indie Fund 的,的出资人之一，还有 The Witness 跟 Bride 的,的开发者，讲者是 Blow。然后本议程是不能摄影的，所以请勿摄影。那就让我们来掌声欢迎我们的讲师，讲者是 Blow。Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, you know, the title of this talk is "Making Games in 2019 and Beyond." It's in a question and answer format where we collected questions beforehand, and I went through and picked the ones that I could make a common thread out of and answered them.、Um, and so the main the main idea about this talk. Is about the kinds of things we should be thinking about today, and how we should approach things in the future. And in order to explain, you know, you know, I tend to have opinions about those things that are different from the usual opinions. And sometimes people hear those opinions and say, "Ah,、oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about." So I thought I would start by saying something about the past to help explain why I have the opinions that I have. And one of the questions, in fact, the first question, very conveniently asked about the past. It was both of your previous games, Braid and The Witness, took years to complete. There must have been highs and lows during the production. Can you tell us what was it like, and how did you deal with them? So, let's talk about Braid for a minute.、Um, uh, this is a game that a lot of people have heard of.、Uh, it's one of the more Recognized indie games from the time when it came out,、uh, and because of that, a lot of people seem to think, "Oh, it, you know, it, development must have gone fine, right? Everybody must have always known this was a good game. Everybody, you know, people were waiting for it to come out or something. There were no problems. Like our imagination, you know, doesn't tend to consider the things that could have happened that we don't know about."、Uh, so let me. Fill in some details about development. So first, the basic idea of the game, which stayed consistent for most of development.、Um, the idea was that we give the player the ability to rewind and undo their mistakes, and that we're very generous with this. It's unlimited. You can invoke this ability at any time. It's not tied to a resource, or you know, you don't run out of rewind and then die. There had been a couple of games before Braid that did rewind, but they all did it in a way. That made the game more complicated, but not different. It was like, oh, you ran out of rewind, now you die. And the idea of the game was, what if you can't die, right? How does the game change if it's no longer about you worried about dying, and and it's about, well, we don't know what. Like at the start of development, we're figuring it out.、Um, I knew that there were going to be many different worlds, and that you would go between them, and that time would behave differently in all the different worlds, and that there would be puzzles. And the puzzles were actually based around the rewind ability, right? Which is different from a game that just has rewind and has puzzles. You can imagine a game. It's like, oh, I'm trying to solve puzzles and I missed a jump, and I'll just rewind back, and that's convenient. But that's not what this game is, right? The, the game is about realizing、uh, things that you didn't understand before about the way time behaves. And about using the way that your rewind ability interacts with the way time behaves to solve the puzzles. So if the puzzles didn't make you understand something new or think about something new, then then they don't go in the game, right? And then the last part of this game is it was done with a very、um, artistic attitude. You know, this game came out in 2008. I started working on it in 2005, and back then the idea that games could be art was actually very controversial.、Um, most people said, "No, games can't be art." There was a small community of developers who said, "Of course, it's art. You guys are crazy." But you couldn't just say that games are art in the way that you can today. And so, I was sort of putting my hat in the ring there. Like, here's how I think about games. Here's how I see them. So it was a very deliberate art game. And、uh, finally, it, well, why was it a platformer, and especially why was it a simple platformer? It's because if you're going to mess around with reality, if you're going to do all this complicated time stuff, and if people are supposed to understand all the complicated time stuff rather than just sitting back and going, "Whoa," 
then you actually need a simple situation to start. So I use this classic Super Mario Brothers situation where there's just a simple monster that goes in a line and you can bounce off his head. And that's so simple that when things start getting weird, it's easier for you to understand how they get weird. So this was all <laughs> very deliberately and carefully thought out really during the early phase of development, right? And, and none of these really makes, like the game is a combination of all these ideas, right? If you just took one of them, if you just took platformer as base reality as your one idea, you get like every platformer, right? Or if you say, well, it's just got rewind, but it doesn't have puzzles or whatever, you would get a very, very different game. So all of these ideas were required to make the game that was made. And I had it playable very early. Back then, it was actually not that common to have a game playable early. It would usually take toward the end of development before you could play it. But I had it playable in the first week and just kept making it bigger and more complicated. And it was a sophisticated game design-wise. Uh, it was the best thing that I knew how to make, but it had programmer art, right? Because it was just me working on the game, and I wasn't even trying to make it look nice yet. In fact, it was just super ugly. Like, I'll show you, this is actually a little bit later in development, but this was the title screen, um, which is probably a little too dark to really see anything, but that's what it's like in the game as well. Um, you know, and here's the first screen that you play. Uh, it brings back memories looking at this. But this is literally, you know, I took an hour or two scribbling in a paint program these different pieces and then put them in a level. And, you know, that's what the game looked like. Uh, here's a later uh, boss level. Um, you may recognize this if you played the actual game. So, of course, once I had enough of a game to play it, I decided, well, okay, you know, the plan is to eventually sell this game to people, so I have to go find somebody to do the art for it, right? All art direct, but I need somebody to draw all the pieces that go in the world that make it look like a serious game. And so I started doing this, and it wasn't very easy back in 2005 or 2006, um, because there wasn't an indie game community like there is today. Uh, there were maybe some people who made casual games on PC about like matching colored balls or something, but those aren't, you know, you don't, there's not enough of a community there that you could find a freelance artist who was good. And in the mainstream industry, first of all, all the artists were 3D now, because 2D games were old and dead. And also because indie games weren't a thing, it's not like a professional 3D artist would quit his high paying job at a big company to work on something that looks like this that nobody will ever care about. So it was actually very hard to find artists for this game. Uh, but I went around the internet and um, just looking on art forums where artists hang out and looking for people and I had a basic deal that I said. I said, look, I'm looking for someone to do art for this game. If you would like to apply for the job, here's what we'll do. I'll send you a screenshot of the game. It was different scenes various times, but it would look something like this, very programmer art. And I said, I'll pay you for two days of your time and just, you know, or however long it takes, three days, four days, and just do a, a mock-up of what your style would look like in this game. Here are some high-level art direction, like the game is colorful, the foreground and background are very distinct. I gave them rules like that, but generally, um, generally it was up to them because I wanted to see what their style uh, would bring to the game. And, you know, I did this process with many artists, but uh, one of the earlier ones sent me a very long email in reply after he'd been had the game for a couple of days. And I got this on November 2nd, the day before my birthday, when I was sitting down to have, an, or getting ready to have a nice birthday. And here's what he said. This is going to be a little long, but I'm going to read it, okay? This is actually a third, it was a way longer email than this. This is cut down. Uh, being an artist tasked to create imagery around the existing game, I hate to do the following evaluation, but also being a game player, it is hard not to. Anyone who played any games on the first Sega or Nintendo consoles got tired of this kind of gameplay 15 years ago. Unless you incorporate some more interesting effects, evolutions, puzzles that need to be solved, then this game doesn't even match up to those for interest. I played games that were similar with my son when he was four, and he got bored with them then. 
To say that I am disappointed is an understatement. I was hoping for a chance to do some good work for a game that would be cool enough to get noticed. Okay, so I'm being brutally honest. Apologies, but the game industry is not forgiving. Like this guy who doesn't work in games is telling me about the game industry now, right? Um, this level of game cannot keep the interest of adults, so it would be best to make it a children's game with children's themes. It is also important in any written project to keep it simple, such as having a one-word description of the action between levels. I also suggest that you give the player a limited number of lives that, when lost, the player restarts at the beginning of the level. Limited lives and collecting power-ups extra lives is a long-established standard in all games that have an adventure interface. The time rewind thing may be a programming help for working out gameplay in the development process, but I find it confusing and annoying if part of the game itself. Perhaps a time rewind token can be collected and used occasionally by the player. Collecting tokens and power-ups that open up new abilities is absolutely vital if a game like this is going to keep any interest at all for more than three screens. I am willing to work on the art for this if you are still interested, <laughs> though I can't see how you can fund art for a project like this, as I can't see how it can make money. So <laughs> that was an especially, you know, it's very negative. <laughs> People call me negative sometimes, but I'm never that negative. Um, you know, and this was one of the first time uh, I'd showed the game to some friends, like I'll talk about later, but this was the first time I'd shown it to a completely random person. Um, and this guy apparently was a gamer and was very offended by my game. Uh, <laughs> but that wasn't really, uh, well, okay. So, there's an interesting point to make here, which is that every single one of the core ideas behind the game that I went through this guy explicitly rejected and, and said something negative about, right? Um, and it seemed like he maybe understood that some of those were the point of the game and maybe not. Like he commented on Rewind being a big thing in the game, but like somehow the fact that this was a package that made sense went past this guy, right? And in fact, you could imagine there was some image forming in his head that I was just, I don't know, maybe a kid because he used adult language like my son or whatever and apologies but the game industry is not forgiving. That's not, not something that you say to a peer, like someone who's on the same level as you, right? So he was like picturing me as some confused guy who just didn't know what was going on. Now the thing is, you know, maybe I just got unlucky and that was just one time. But there was lots of things like this, that was the worst one. But there were several. So one of the other artists I tried to get to work on the game, um, we did this audition process, and I liked what he did. Like, we definitely would have needed to develop more concepts for the rest of the game, but it was good enough that I said, you know, let's give this a try, you've got the job. And then I never got a reply from him. This was by email, and a week later I was like, hey, you've got the job, do you want to start? And I never got a reply. This was a guy in, in Eastern Europe, somewhere. Uh, so it's not like I could like go to his house. <laughs> um, but the funny thing is, just six weeks ago, I was in the Czech Republic at another video game conference and I ran into this guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I didn't know it was him at first, but he came up and introduced himself. And, you know, we were both in a good mood and he said, you know, I'm sorry I, I dropped out of doing your game. I just didn't understand what what you wanted, it just seemed very confusing, and it didn't seem like a good opportunity for me. Biggest mistake of my career, ha ha ha, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into some more, maybe in a little bit, but um, it wasn't all negative. So around 2006, uh, I submitted the game to the Independent Games Festival, which had been running for some years. And I was like, you know, it's an ugly game, but uh, they have a game design category, maybe we can win that. And it actually did. It, the, the way this festival works is there's a bunch of judges who are also uh, video game developers, and enough of them noticed that it was an interesting game, I guess, to advocate for it or something, and um, it won. And that was great, so that was like, all right, 
we've got some official external recognition. Now keep in mind, you have to project back. Like, um, nobody knew about this game, right? And so something like this is actually significant, right? It's not, it's not a famous thing. Like some people in these circles knew me because I gave conference lectures a lot, but, but I hadn't released a game that they had ever seen. So on the backs of that, um, well, it's always very easy to underestimate how much time is left in development. So I thought there was about eight months left, 10 months left. So I wanted to start talking to people to try to publish it. Um, so Steam had existed back then. It was very different than today. Uh, Steam back then was a heavily curated storefront that did not have very many games on it. Um, and they were mostly AAA games. There had been a small number of independent games. Uh, but anyway, I, I went to the, the Steam guy who was in charge of curating for the store, and I said, here's a build of the game. It's coming out hopefully in a year, hopefully less. Um, this is to demonstrate the gameplay. We're going to polish this a lot before it's done, especially the graphics aren't final. They're going to get way better, right? And Steam rejected the game, and I had a phone conversation with the guy, and he said, this game will sell less than 5,000 copies on Steam. Uh, this was at a time when Steam had 13 million users and not very many games. So he was really, he was telling me, like, nobody is going to buy this game. It's not worth our time. It's not worth your time. Now, in the middle of, you know, in the run-up of development, I was paying attention to what was going on in the market in places like Xbox Live Arcade, which was the other uh, place that I was thinking of launching the game. And sort of the top third of the games on Xbox Live Arcade were selling between 100 and 200,000 copies. And so for this guy to say, <laughs> you're going to sell 5,000 copies, this is just really like dirt, right? Very, very, very negative opinion of the game. Now, this was all very strange because, you know, I'd sent the game to some friends very early on, like when it was even much earlier than the version I was sending these guys, and it was super ugly. Like this shot at the bottom, if you thought the earlier shot was ugly, like this is what the first version that my friend played looked like. It's just funny looking back at it. Um, it was hard to see, like the walls are too dark. This ladder is literally something that I drew in Photoshop by like taking a brush and like, making the line vertical. Why is it green? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, but my friends understood and enjoyed the game. Um, not universally. There was maybe one person out of the eight people I sent it to who didn't really like it. But it was a very different response than I was getting from all these other people. And I, I just wasn't really sure why, right? Um, but uh, you know, it's not good to give up easily. So I tried the back channel approach which was I had a friend who lived in Seattle who knew a bunch of the people at Valve, which is the company that makes Steam. And he said, hey, hey guys who work at Valve, trust me. I, I know this guy's game. It's good. Give it a try. You know, play it all the way through. Talk about it. And then see if we can sort of convince the Steam curator that, that this is actually really a good game. Um, so we tried that. And uh, they didn't like the game either. <laughs> They said a lot of things. They had reasons like, oh, the game's too hard. The level design isn't good enough. Um, and generally, indie games don't sell. Nobody's going to buy this game, right? All of these things were said. But these are all, you know, these are all just reasons. Like, the real fundamental problem is like they just weren't excited by the game, right? If somebody's excited by the game, but they see a problem with it, they figure, well, we'll, we'll find a way to work around this. Or they'll give you the benefit of the doubt, like, oh, I, you know, I think maybe I don't like your level design a little bit, but that's not incurable, right? We can fix that. There's a difference between people having a positive attitude and a neutral to negative attitude. And even though they said there was good stuff that they saw in the game, it was definitely a neutral to negative attitude. Um, as relayed to my, by my friend, I didn't actually talk to them, but, but he forwarded me comments about the game. Um, and of course, while all this was happening, it was coming time for Independent Games Festival again. And my plan had been, well, if we can win game design in 2008, we just have to make the rest of the presentation good, get good graphics and sound in there. 
and maybe we'll win game of the year in 2007. We'll submit again. Back then, you were allowed to resubmit your game. You can't do that anymore. Um, so uh, the problem with the plan was that due to having difficulty getting an artist for the game, uh, the art wasn't that much better. It was a little better. Um, you know, sound wasn't that much better. It was a little better. But I really had a lot of faith in the game. The puzzles had been developed. The level design, I thought, was really good at this point. So I submitted it. And uh, not only did it not win game of the year, it didn't even make finalists. So, you know, there were like six or seven games that everybody thought much more deserved to be game of the year than this one. And you get notes from the judges, and they were all like, meh, didn't really like the game. Like, I wasn't even sure that, I couldn't even tell if the judges knew that it had won game design the year before, because they were just very, uh, not that exciting comments. Anyway, I, this, I've said a lot of things about the development of this game, but it was like three years of this kind of stuff, <laughs> over and over. Um, it all worked out in the end. We launched on Xbox Live Arcade because one of the guys who saw the game when I was showing it at GDC from, from the Game Design Award in 2006, uh, he looked past the graphics and saw that it was an interesting game and signed it up. Uh, I don't think other people at Xbox understood it, but uh, you know, it, it was enough. I just sort of cruised through. Um, and eventually we launched in the Summer of Arcade promotion, and a lot of people played the game and, and really enjoyed it. And, and from there, uh, it took off, right? Uh, th this wasn't even uh, without incident. So Microsoft threatened to cancel the game off Xbox Live Arcade at least once, like two days before it was done. Uh, and, and another time when they just sort of stopped answering my emails for a month. Um, that was sort of the silent, like, threatened to cancel. Um, other stuff happened, like I, I was having trouble finding individual artists to work on the game. So I worked with an art outsourcing company in San Francisco, and they put people on the game. And I'd spent $20,000 US on the art, which was a lot for me at the time. And then they said, we don't want you as a customer anymore. We don't want to work on your game because we went to GDC and got bigger customers. And so then I had like a game with like four levels had art in a style that nobody else was ever going to do. It was a mess. We had to redo all that stuff. So now, you know, it's, <laughs> it's less painful for me to look back at this today because things have been very successful with this game. And it's very tempting to just say, you know, ha ha, all those people were wrong. My game was good. They're stupid. I'm smart. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, it's human to feel a little bit of that. But it's actually not constructive, and it doesn't make you better at making video games, right? So the thing that makes you better at making video games is to look at all these examples of this game that, that had a very good public response, and, and why couldn't people see that the response was going to be that good, right? That's sort of the lesson, or the question. And so the observation I took out of that is just, you know, it's really hard for people to understand what your game is going to be when it's done, right? If you're, if you've started something or you're, you're working on it, you're maybe in the middle, it's far from being done. You know the connections between all of where it is and where it's going to be. So maybe you see it as being even closer to being done than it is, but other people can't fill in those gaps. Right? And they'll see it maybe as being further from done than you see it. Or they won't even think of it that way. They'll think of it as this is a worse game than you think it is. And the weirder the game is, the more negative people's assessment is going to be. Because human beings very often work from examples. If something is similar to a thing that you've seen many times before, you understand it. If, and you understand the potential of it because you've seen other things like that succeed. If something is just weird, we don't know. We don't know what that is. We're not going to assume it's going to succeed because we haven't seen things like that succeed because we haven't seen things like that. So an extension of this is very important for independent developers to understand. It's hard for people to understand your game even if that is their job that they're supposedly a professional at, right? So the Steam guy and several other people that I left out of the story 
um, is their job to pick the good games. And they saw this game and they were like, this game looks terrible, you know? And, you know, at the same time, I said my friends didn't think it was terrible. Now, part of that might just be like, hey, we're friends, you know, so like maybe friend relationships make everything nicer or something. But I, I think it went beyond that. It was like they gave the game a different kind of attention than a neutral person would because whatever those gaps were between what they see and what it would need to be to be a good game, you know, they know me. They know that I work hard and they know that I would probably fill those gaps in or something, right? Or, or they know that this thing that I'm giving them is not a waste of their time, at least, and they're going to pay attention and, and play it. Whereas some random art guy that I send the thing to, maybe, for all he knows, it could be a waste of his time. So all of that was an answer to the first question. Um, but we're going to draw upon it to answer many of the other questions. Here's another one. Um, what is your opinion on top-down game design behind closed doors versus more reactive design in the open, right? So top-down game design is the kind of thing we always used to do where you work on the development, or you work on the game and you do the development just maybe in secret for a long time. And then you release it and you try to get everybody to pay attention to the game. And now the thing that's happening more um, when, uh, you know, now that the internet is everywhere and people buy so many games on it, we have this early access model where your game isn't very much done and you just try to get it out in people's hands and, and not just for financial reasons, but also for design reasons, like just see what they like, see what they don't like, see how they react to your game and make design decisions based on what people like or don't like. And this is a complex question because I think a lot of things about this. One of the things I think is like, look, feedback is good. It's very easy to have weird ideas about how, what your game is like and how well it works and how good of a game it is. Um, and seeing other people interact with your game can shatter any illusions that you have. And the newer you are at game development, the more this is helpful because you don't have as much experience to draw on, so you need this evidence from the world. But on the other hand, all that stuff I was saying about Braid for 15 minutes that I lived through for three years <laughs> taught me that people can't see what your game is going to be, especially if it's very creative. So if you release something in early access and it's far from what it's going to be, I think most of the feedback will be incorrect. It'll be wrong feedback. The most positive thing that will happen is that the feedback will be conservative because people will look at your game They'll look at whatever they know that is the closest to your game that they understand, which will be some established game design, and they'll say it should be more like that established game design, right? Um, and then, you know, if, if it gets worse than that, you could get guys who are like that first artist, I quote, who are very, very negative. And we certainly know that on the internet, people are very negative about games. Um, and so I'm not sure... I'm not sure we should give them more reasons to be negative. Another question. Um, the Witness being a larger team and such an intricate game, what were the challenges in your collaborative process in order to make a game with multiple layers of often abstract ideas where iterations can be very costly? Um, this was also one of the top questions in my mind when we started the game. And Braid was uh, a much smaller game. We knew Witness was going to be bigger. Well, I knew because there was nobody else on the project at the beginning. Um, and I had this question, if we do a 3D game, that's labor intensive. And if the world is big, it, it needs people to work on it. And is it gonna be hard to make it a personal feeling art game once we have a bigger team? Because that was one of the things that people liked about Braid, is it feels, it didn't feel like a shrink-wrapped commercial product. It felt um, personal. And can we make a game that feels personal, or at least artistic? And I think, I think The Witness feels very, very different from Braid, but I feel like it was successful what we managed to do in terms of feel. Um, and, and part of that is because I was thinking about this problem all the time from the beginning. So I knew that we were gonna make this game. It had an island where you could go anywhere and it was full of puzzles and different areas and the areas had to look different. 
so that you could navigate and that they would make a strong impression in your memory. And we were going to do a lot of interesting things with light and shadow and reflections and color. And all of those things um, referenced each other in different ways to make a sort of a complicated knot of string, mental string tied across the island from place to place. Now, in, in answering the question about what the biggest challenge was, the biggest challenge was really making sure that everybody on the team understood the game that we were making. Because it's an art game, that was very important. Um, and just like I've been saying that it's hard for you know, people at a store to understand your game, it's hard for players to understand your game, it's hard for people on your team to understand your game, um, especially at the beginning. So I'm, I have close-ups of these pictures. This is what the game looked like pretty early on in development. We had very little in the way of technical tools. I hadn't designed that many puzzles. So there was just like this <laughs> single mesh with like a little bit of water and some blocks. And you could sort of walk everywhere, but it was very uncomfortable sometimes. It was only playable if you were very charitable about what you consider playable. Um, but uh, you know, it was something. <laughs> it was enough to communicate, OK, this is kind of the game that we're making. But the problem is that a lot of the ideas behind the game were subtle. right? These ideas were things about um, what the player understands as they navigate from puzzle to puzzle and making patterns out of that understanding. Or um, where a player's attention is as they walk into an area and how we divert that attention in a surprising way sometimes, right? And you can't get that kind of subtlety out of something like this. So I would meet with the team. I would say, here are some of the high level directives for the art. It's a colorful art style with high contrast so that it's easy to recognize things and key in on, um, key in on details. There's not a lot of, um, you would say, high frequency texture details. So I gave a brick wall texture as the thing that we wouldn't do because that creates a lot of, a lot of needless detail that, that cause noise in people's perceptual field. And so we would do something more like a generally muted red wall when we did brick with very slight lines in it that you could barely see. Anyway, we would say all this at the beginning. But a game is so complicated, you can't say all the things that people need to think about. And you can't say them at the level of detail that people need to understand to do the work. right? Now, later in development, by the time we get to something more like this, which I think is still probably about a year and a half before the game was done, something like that, maybe more. Um, by the time you get here, you've tried a lot of things. Like, oh, here are our high level ideas of what the art style should be. But wait a minute, leaves on a tree are very, very different from a wall. And do we need to generate different interpretations of these rules for trees versus wall? And what about grass? You know, and, and just the, there are many, many questions for years. Um, and so over the course of the development of the game, we were building this understanding of what this really meant to treat the player's attention as precious in this space and create a very focused space for puzzle solving. And you say that in the beginning, and, and people say, yeah, yeah, I get it. But they can't really get it, because again, we're human beings, and we go by example. So by the, by the time you get late in development, you've seen a lot of examples. You've seen things that succeeded. You've seen things that failed. And so you form a pattern in your mind of what really works. And by that point, uh, we're able to do things, and they're good. But prior to this, we would often have to have a lot of back and forth. So I would say, let's do a design for this area. And people would do some things, like they would model and texture some things. And I'd be like, no, this, this breaks this rule, and that breaks this other rule, and come on. And we would go back and forth like three or four times. And it, it was very tedious and time consuming. But it was because we don't really know yet. <laughs> and then later on, we get closer and closer. But you know, we never quite got there. 
because it's a big and complicated game. Now, what I just described was the situation with people like 3D artists and modelers. But when you have external people like architects or something, which we did, we hired architects to make many of the structures in the island, uh, to design them and give us the initial meshes for them, which we would then clean up for game purposes. And um, the difficulty with that is that architects really, you know, in general, don't play video games all day and didn't grow up on video games, at least the ones that we worked with. And so there was this extra wide gap to try to explain the game to them. And it was very important because there were tricky situations. So we would have large structures like this one. You know, the player size is like tiny. This is a doorway on the right hand side where the player would come in. We had large puzzles like this, or large areas that had many puzzles within them, all of which had interlocking dependencies. And so the, we had to have lots of iterations so that the artists would understand the gameplay, or the architects would have to understand the gameplay constraints. Um, this happens all the time everywhere, that people are like making a video a game in a team is about people proceeding forward based on their understanding of what you're making. And because everybody is different, everybody's understanding of what you are making is different. So here's a game we're working on right now. This is actually a level that I designed last week. Again, it's not trying to look good. It's just a bunch of cubes. But we're also trying to figure out the look of the game. So. Um, we picked this as one of the levels that we should look at to try to figure out the art style. And um, here is the, uh, you know, the in-game beautification that we did for this level. And it looks a lot better, right? I think so. Like this looks, you know, eh. And that looks like something that people might actually buy on Steam or somewhere. It's, of course, not done, but it's a good step. There's a problem, though. <laughs> the problem is, in this level, I had some idea in my head about what was going on. There's like some platform that this guy, blue robe guy, is standing on. And it's, I mean, it's on some big uh, columns. And I'm thinking of it as maybe a broken platform because it's got some squares. So maybe this was originally a bigger rectangle, and some parts of it are broken. Um, and these down here are really an excuse for like insert architectural reason later why this thing is standing up. Now, these protrude onto the play field. So the player can drop down to the bottom floor. But if he does that, it's actually a fail condition on this puzzle. Um, spoilers. <laughs> if, you reach, if you reach the floor, you just can't get up again and, and you have to undo. Uh, so even though it looks like you might do something down here, it's really, it's not supposed to be that interesting, right? It's just, just a tiny little thing. So now, one of the directives when we were trying to make the level look good was, let's try to help the player understand the structure of the level. So that, because we have these things floating in space, like this might even be hard to decode from in the audience, but this is in the background, you know, and this is floating in space more in the foreground. Probably easier to see here. And um, well, uh, you know, her initial attempt was let's actually bring these out here, right? So that you can see, you know, you not only see this line up here on top, you see it on bottom, you see this on bottom. Your brain can maybe make more sense of where these squares are located in space, which is good. However, as a game designer, or as my flavor of game designer, I look at this and I immediately get like, ah, I don't like this. Um, and the reason is because uh, down here, if you look down here, now that this column is no longer on the left side of the board and now that it's thicker, we've made a space behind it. And if you play a lot of block pushing Sokoban games, which this is, um, you know that as soon as you see a level, you start looking at details like that and trying to understand why they're important, right, as a player. You're like, oh, I must need to walk through there or, you know, push a block through there or something. And so a red herring 
like a misleading, a misleading thing to pay attention to has been introduced into this level. Why? Because that's just what happens when multiple people make games. <laughs> and the problem is, the problem is, you know, if you're making a games with hundreds of levels, it's likely for this to happen on every level. And what are you going to do about that? So um, this will feed into the next question. As a game director, how do you decide that a piece of artwork has reached the requirement or standard of the project? And this is another question, I think. Um, but they're similar, so I'm putting them together. A lot of times, when brainstorming and seeking references, we set up ver visions and concepts and have a clear style guideline and direction with mood boards, but the artwork produced just never seems to be up there, or it's hard to decide if it's a really good fit. For example, the costume designs of the characters don't exactly match the scene in the background. We have different artists for the scenes and the characters. Is it a problem with our production method or communication or issues with documentation? Well, the theme, <laughs> the theme of this presentation so far has been about communicating what the game is about to people. And um, I just got done saying it's hard to communicate what the game is about with the team. But sometimes it's hard even for yourself. Like just knowing, like you look at something and you know that it's not good enough or you know that it's not what you want but you're not sure what to do about it. That happens sometimes. And so, what do I do about this? Um, that wasn't the only issue in those questions. It's the first one that I'm attacking. Um, you know, my, my personal flavor of game design, and it's pretty good, I recommend sometimes thinking about things this way, is to have this idea that everything in your game affects everything else, right? Not just in one level, where if I look at one thing, it might draw my attention away from another thing, but in a game. If one character looks cooler than another character because the art was better, maybe people will like that character more, right? Um, if one world looks better than another world, maybe people will like that world more. And then maybe the reason you're getting negative feedback on the special gameplay that only happens in the other world is not because the gameplay is that bad, it's because the art wasn't good enough to motivate people through it, right? Um, these things happen. And no one of them is ever quite as big of a factor as what I just said, but they mix together, um, and little by little, they make a very complex situation of interplaying things, right? And now, I don't even remember when I was introduced to this concept, but an idea that I picked up about art when I was very young um, is that art is the right making of things. It's that if you're going to make a certain kind of thing, there are all these factors that affect how good or bad it is, right? How, how harmonious or disharmonious it is. And your job making art is to balance those things, right? It's to, to produce the... <laughs> Produce the most right uh, association of those things that you are humanly capable of doing, right? And this is something, I don't know how it is here, but I think in the USA and Europe, we've basically thrown away this idea about what art is. And art is more like about being trendy or you know, just having new ideas in a gallery or something. And I think it's a shame because I think we've really... Um, We've really lost some important things in throwing away this idea. Anyway, when I go to design something, whether it's a level or a whole game, I'm always looking at it this way, that there is some most agreeable settings of the parameters that are all pulling on each other. And I need to find it. Um, and that may be one way that you can approach a situation like this. So the costume designs on the characters don't match the background. Um, there are two ways to attack this problem. One is by attacking the elements of the problem, and one is by attacking the composition, right? The grouping of the whole problem. To attack the elements, well, maybe you get the characters to match 
the style of the background. How do you do that? Maybe you just get a whip and you keep whipping the character artists until they mimic style better, right? Maybe you fire those artists and get different character artists. Maybe you're not that mean. Maybe you just give them a lot of time to develop and you give them only that task, like, look, just try really hard to match this style. That might cost more money than you have. Maybe you don't have that much time and money. Um, maybe you get the background artist to paint over the characters <laughs> once the characters are all existing, um, which, or, or model over them if it's a 3D thing, um, which is not enjoyable at all, but if that's the thing that you can do, then you can do that. Um, or you might be able to bridge over this problem on a composition level, right? Well, if the designs of the characters don't match the background, maybe there's an opportunity that we can get from that, right? Can we tweak the designs of the characters to be something still within the style that the character artists are able to do, um, but that, that is more intentional? Can we draw some value out of the fact that the characters in the background don't match, right? Can we, can we bring that into the set of things that our game is playing with intentionally, right? And so, that's the job of an art director, really. Even on AAA games with very large budgets, people's art styles don't totally match, like very often. And, and the more experience you have in games, the more you can look at one of those games and tell, oh, the person who modeled this thing is a different person <laughs> than whoever modeled the thing sitting right next to it, because you can see. And art directors of really big games um, just have developed the skill of being able to live with that fact of reality and make it come out good in the end. But going back to this question that, you know, well, we make artwork, but it just never seems to be as good as we want. What can we do about that? Um, so firstly, like I said before, some artists are just better than others, <laughs> right? That's a mean thing to say sometimes, but we all know, like, we all know that some people are better at doing things. But that's not necessarily a permanent value judgment on the person, right? Because people get better at things the more they practice them, right? So, again, I think in the US we have a problem with admitting things like this. I don't know how it is here. Um, but we're at a point now where we, many people won't even say something in public, like that some artists are better than others. Um, because we'll say it's all relative, it's complicated, there's all these factors, and that's true also. So there, there's other things, so for example, you might have an artist that's very good at one style of thing, amazing at it, but that's not your game style. So they're a very good artist, but they're maybe not a good artist for your game, right? Um, but, again, people get better at things when they practice. So if you're starting to make a game, if it's got its own style that's not just a copy of some other game's style, maybe actually there are no artists who are good at that style because it's a new thing that you're doing, right? And so maybe it's in the development process that people need to practice working on the style of your game and get better at it, right? So from, from that standpoint, it's like, some artists are good, some are not. Maybe none are good <laughs> from the relative perspective of what you're trying to do. And that is a hard place to be, but we end up there a lot. And so then what do you do as a director? You do your best to just try to give everybody the time to figure out the game, right? And to become good at your game. How do you do that? Well, you can do lots of iteration, as I discussed. Um, you talk about what's working, what's not working, and you have to do it again and again and again because, like I said, people don't really understand. You can have a discussion with some people and say, hey, we're working on this area in The Witness and, you know, this art rule was uh, designed to help with the player's attention in a certain way and this area doesn't do that because of this model and, and the way this thing is colored, and we can have that discussion and they say, oh yeah, I get it now, I get it now. Oh yeah, I forgot about that rule, or I wasn't thinking about it. Um, and then, because we're human beings, we tend to think that we understand completely, right? But really, we understand more, but not completely. And so there's still a big gap. 
And so this kind of conversation, from what I've seen, just has to happen over and over. And you get closer every time. And for me personally, one of my character flaws is that I don't like repeating myself. Um, so I get very frustrated with these. But I'm, I'm doing my best to just be kind and understand that this is the reality of the situation, is that it's hard to make these games. It's hard for us to understand what's in each other's head. And even knowing that, it's harder than you think, even if you thought you knew that, right? And we just keep working on it. Maybe that's why my games take a million years to make. Um, but the other thing to understand is that in the beginning, because everybody is new at the game, most things probably won't come out well. Like, you can't usually expect, for example, a bunch of visual artists to walk onto your game if it's a new style and have it all just be beautiful and amazing because um, it, it doesn't work that way. Again, unless, unless you're making something that looks like everything else. But um, back to this perspective of the right making of things. As I said, as I said, there's a, you can view things as individual elements or you can view the game as the composition of those elements. That's actually too much of a breakdown. It's not that simple, <laughs> but it's, it's an easy model to think about. And those elements, when they combine, can either self-strengthen and self-weaken. I said self-sabotage here, but I think self-weaken is a better term. So when you're art directing a game like this, it might actually be OK if some stuff doesn't look that good. You know, There's things in every game that I've done that I wish looked better. You know, and it's just people have limited, we're human beings and we have limited time and energy and effort. And so <laughs> the challenge is to make things beautiful even when not everything is good. Um, I, I should have put a, a slide, uh, I'll just mention it. There's a painting uh, by an artist named Soraya. Um, it's a very famous painting about a bunch of people weaving a, a giant sail for a ship. And there's just, you see the curves of the sail, and the light just plays on them really beautifully. It's a very large painting. It's in London right now, if anyone's going to London. Um, but I was there looking at this painting. And above one of the characters, who is painted very well, there's just some flowers. And one of them was like terrible. It was like he went with, with his brush and just made a little thing. And this flower just looks so ugly and offensive to me. But, but I had to admit that, that it, it was fine. Like, it didn't ruin the painting. The painting was still beautiful. And so I think we're all in that position. You know, there are things, there are things in The Witness, even design-wise or just writing-wise, that I wish I had done better. Um, they can never be perfect. And so our challenge is to take those elements and compose them as best we can. So another question. How do you gain a level of confidence that innovative game designs will be accepted by the player, or is it a gamble every time? Uh, well, it's a gamble every time. But like I hope I've been saying, you should see your job as communicating with the player and helping them understand why your game is interesting, right? You know it's interesting. Do they know it's interesting? Uh, another question. When making a reasonably good game often doesn't cut it nowadays, what would your advice be to developers just starting out given our current market reality? For premium games to sell nowadays, it seems like the emphasis is on creating hype, and then the first few days of sales will probably decide the lifespan of a, previous, of a premium game. Do you think this is good or bad? If bad, what do you think the industry or market need to do to improve the situation? Lucas Pope had an interview on Return of the Obra Dinn saying, if a developer makes a truly remarkable game, the game will generate enough volume by itself. Do you think that this is the case if the developer has no track record? It's a lot to think about. Um, but I think a lot of people are concerned with this basic question today. Um, I don't think Lucas is wrong. I disagree to a point. Like, I would not encourage people not to think about how to market their game or, or how, people will, how people will be excited to buy it, because that's a basic survival skill. However, I think in the modern world, if you go to a conference and hear what people have to say, there's way too much concern about how do I get people to buy my game. And the reality is, I mean, 
unless you're making a, a mobile game, I guess, um, the, the most important factor really is uh, how good and how remarkable the game is. Um, so Lucas has something figured out, though. If you look at his games, especially the two most famous ones, Papers, Please, and Oberdin, they're very strong in terms of communicating that there's something going on here, right? This is the logo title screen for Papers, Please. That's a gameplay screenshot. Um, on the one hand, this is obviously not a high budget screenshot. On the other hand, it's very coherent. It's got things happening. It's interesting. You look at that and you're like, oh, what's going on there, right? Obra Dinn, similarly, right? This is a really nice image that's not like any other game that you've seen. This is a very striking image. It's not like any other game that you've seen. It also didn't cost billions of dollars and thousands of people to make, right? So Lucas has figured something out. Um, and the problem with following his advice is that his advice will work if you figured out the same things that he has about making your game noticeable. If you haven't, and you just trust that you're going to release your game and people will buy it, you may be wrong. Okay? But so, so like I said, don't ignore market realities. But the problem is if you pay too much attention, then you end up making the same games as everybody else. Because so many other people are just worried about selling their game. What do you do when you're worried about that? You say, I'm going to design and build the thing that's going to have the highest probability of making money. But that's what everybody else is trying to do. And so you end up paradoxically making your situation worse because you're competing, because now you're in a situation where you have to convince people that your game that looks just like 15 other games is actually the one that they want. That's hard. So it's hard, it's hard if you just try to be a commercial clone game, and it's hard if you're going to be an original game. It's hard no matter what. And you may fail no matter what, and just don't panic about that. Right? My first company failed. Um, we, from 1996 to 2000, we made a 3D game. Uh, there were hard times, <laughs> didn't have much money, um, and eventually we closed the company. Uh, but it, I consider it a success in a certain way because I worked really hard on things that were pushing the edge of my ability all the time. So it taught me how to program. It taught me at least some of how to design. The design of that game actually wasn't that good, but it was, it was a learning experience. And it put me in a position to do better things later on, like Braid. And so even though that company went out of business, it was not a waste of time, right? Whereas if you do a business and your only plan is to make money and you're going to make a game like somebody else's game, and then you take two years and work hard, late hours, and you make that game, it comes out, nobody buys it, and then what? Well, you wasted two years of your life maybe doing boring things. So that's my biggest advice is don't do that. Right? Uh, the human species <laughs> has way too many people just trying to pick low-hanging fruit and do the easy thing. And so the challenge, the call that I have for people is to be the ones who walk past the low-hanging fruit and say, somebody else will get that. It's fine. I'm going to go out there and look for the fruit that nobody even knows what it is yet. Right? We need more people willing to do that. And then the last question. The common game engines nowadays, like Unity and Unreal, they just update so fast and frequently. As a newcomer in the industry, I really feel overwhelmed, and I don't feel like I can keep up with learning the new features, digesting new technology, et cetera. What should I do? Well, the way I think about this is to distinguish carefully between knowledge that is just surface knowledge, like trivia, and knowledge that is deep. So knowledge that is surface is stuff like Unity added a new checkbox over here that will turn on an effect in the shader if you enable it, but it doesn't totally work well in the shadow pass, so turn off you know, shadow casting on those objects or whatever. right? And those engines are full of that kind of stuff. And to some degree, you do need to know them to get work done. But don't take them very seriously, because they won't matter in two years, or five years, or some number of years. But there's deep knowledge that will matter always, or almost always. And by the time it's old, it'll be close enough to something else <laughs> that you'll be able to learn the new thing easily. So deep knowledge is things like, you know, how are 3D objects represented, 
right? How, what happens when the pixels get drawn on the screen? What is a shader in the first place? And why, why is a shader that way? Why isn't there just our program? Like, why do we break things out into these shaders, right? How, what happens in a player's mind when they walk up and start to solve a puzzle, right? All of these things are important. They'll make you better at games the more of them that you know, and they will last a long time. And they will make you more equipped to be one of the people who can go past the low-hanging fruit and venture out into the unknown. So that is everything that I had to say today. Uh, thank you. I think we have time for questions. Yeah? OK, great. Okay, hello. Um, I'm Brian, and um, thank you for all the talk. Uh, you mentioned that um, it's hard for people to understand the game. You keep mentioning that even if they're on the team. The, and then you also say that feedback is good, but it'll be wrong if people couldn't understand what the game should become. And then you come, you come along and say that you need to be constantly um, communicating with your team, um, especially on the art style, um, to figure things out. And so this essentially kind of means that there is a learning curve um, for your team to be on, to be uh, more comfortable on developing the project, and do you have any advice on how to minimize that learning curve? Well, I'm not sure that I'm actually the best person at that process, right? Um, having meetings annoys me, you know, talking to people about work annoys me, and so it's taken me a long time to get as good at it as I am today, which is maybe not as good as some of the people in this room, for all I know, right? Um, I, the, the problem is that I think that the correct advice depends very heavily on an individual game. The most that I could say generally is you just have to understand, this actually applies to everything, <laughs> you just have to understand the best that you can, which is not very well, what the other person's viewpoint is, you know, what, what they might understand about the game now, and what, what they might not understand that you never even thought would be an issue because it's obvious to you, right? If you can identify those things early, um, you can save a lot of time, but what exactly those might be is very specific to a game. Hi, bro. Uh, thank you. Your talk uh, very thoughtful, as always. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, uh, you said like uh, you think uh, wh uh, what's the game really important is uh, to explore new territory of the game, not uh, capture the the low hanging fruit. Yes, and I I I heard in your other talks like you say uh, what's uh, uh, what's really important is how to use the game as the media. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, how how could we? Uh, is there a direction? Can can you point us out? What do, uh, what's the uh, the direction of uh, scouting the new territory of the game? Because I I knew you you have said something like. Uh, uh, do something that only the game media could do, but other media can could not do. Yes, and what I think is my personal uh, thought about this is uh, com combine the game with the uh, the psychology. For example, if this count as something uh, 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 a new way for exploiting 
game media, or you think this is maybe uh, not fit in, into what you say the, the uh, only game media can do, but other things can do? Yes. I, I, I don't know if I, I absolutely, yes. Well, the, the point behind me asking more people to get out there and explore is because people will explore in different directions based on their own personal style. And some, somebody else, like you, will go and do something very different from what I would ever do. And you know, when, when people do that and succeed, we get much richer results. And the medium will develop more strongly in that case. Um, so if you have an idea about psychology, that's not even an area where I have much of an education. So I can't have very many ideas about psychology. Not, not in, a, in a formal way, right? I always think about what goes on in the player's mind, but I'm not trying to do anything um, analytical. So if you see a promising direction, I would encourage you to go try it. And sometimes that's hard, right? Sometimes I have this vague idea, but I don't know what's a good game. And that's just the work. That's the work that we do. So uh, I wish you good luck in that. But I, it, you know, it sounds like an interesting direction if you see something there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Danny. Uh, first of all, thanks for this uh, beneficial talk. Uh, my question is uh, from a te uh, technical view. Uh, would you recommend newcomers or indie developers to use a uh, software like Unity or Unreal or, or, by, or coding by, by, by themselves or, or, or just write every function by, by, by themselves? Well, um, if you're new to games, I think the most useful thing you can do is get experience fast. And that probably means something like Unity or Unreal, unless what you want is experience programming. And then maybe it's better to, to sit down and write something from scratch. It depends. Maybe you even start programming in Unity for a little bit and then graduate later. The problem, so the, the engines like that uh, are very appealing at first because you get things on the screen very fast, but you pay for that later. Like at the end, if you're trying to do something very challenging or very specific and the engine doesn't do exactly what you want and it's got bugs that, and whatever, you can spend a great deal of effort trying to deal with that and then be sad because you still couldn't fix the problem completely. However, if you're new, you're hopefully not trying to do something that hard and sophisticated yet. So I would say for new people, it's, it's fine you know, to use those things. I think if you're established and have been in games for a long time, it's often a good idea to, well, it's my personal style <laughs> to have a different tool set. You know? I, I like using a specific code base built for the game because it lets me do very specific, like I can just go change the way the core works if that's gonna be better for the game and you can't really do that if you didn't, if you don't control it, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, to, if, you're, if you're excited about games and you're new to it, by all means, use those engines. Just be thinking about the long term. I always encourage people to think about the long term that in 10 years, Maybe every year you pick up a little bit of more knowledge on the side that helps you do your own thing. Uh, uh, here's my second question. Uh, uh, by what means or in what way can, in, or in what way can we learn the so-called deep knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little bit difficult to say because uh, we sort of have to decide what we think is deep, right? The rules of physics are not gonna tell us what's deep about games, you know? Um, on the other hand, if we just decide anything, we could decide that stupid things are deep. So um, I don't really have a good answer for that right now. For me, it's just a feeling that I've developed over time. That might be a good idea for a speech is to figure out really how to draw the distinction. What I would say, though, is it's useful 
even if you don't know what is in which category, it's useful to look at things and just think about, is this, is this really fundamental to games or is it just a random Unity thing, right? And, and that'll give you a lot of perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Are we... 嗯，由于我们这边有口译官，所以除了用英文来发问之外，也可以用中文。对，谢谢。I'm um, sorry, it's me again. Okay. Um, this is more specific to the witness because I I just started playing the witness. Um, and I haven't finished yet because the puzzles are too hard for me for my brain to process. <laughs> Um, but like when I first started playing the game, I was like, "What is this game? It's 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 both puzzle and exploration, and perhaps it has more layers to it." But like, I was like, "If I'm if I was the publisher, I'd be like, how would this game sell?" But then, so this this question kind of boils down to like, how do you come up to the ultimate conclusion that you knew that these um, the like all these ideas come together would make a great game. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's just the designer's job, right? <laughs> I mean, correct. correct. <laughs> so, so the way I do it is, so some people say you should make games for yourself and things that you'll be excited about. And other people say you should make games for the market that you know that people will buy. And I'm the first one. I make games that I'm excited about. So, but, but it's easy for us to lie to ourselves about what's exciting, especially if we're new. Because if you make something and it's yours, that's exciting. It's like, it's like if a kid is your son, right? To somebody else, he's just some guy. <laughs> but to you, he's your son. And you have to get past that a little bit, right? And say, how exciting is this really? Um, but if it is exciting, then, then you can sort of ask, well, is it only exciting to me or is it exciting to people who like puzzle games and like exploring or whatever? And, and to me, it seemed like that would be the case and that there would be people out there who would like the game, but I didn't know. I didn't know for sure. In fact, you know, one of the things about the game is we released it at a relatively high price for an independent game. It was $40 US when it came out, whereas high-priced indie games were $30. And everybody was like, oh my god, what's he doing setting the price that high? And the reason is because I didn't know how many people would buy the game. And if it was only going to be a small set of committed puzzle people, then we needed to get money from those people, you know? Um, and, and those people would buy your game even if it's expensive, right? And, and so it might be that we made less money in the end because we didn't price it lower, and that turned away some people. Um, I don't know, I can't run that experiment in another reality. But so I didn't know what was going to happen. And I just made the best choices that I knew how to make. And that's the job. So, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hello. Uh, I, I want to ask you, uh, uh, nowadays, the game is more about storytelling in the important part of the game. Uh, I want to ask, uh, how, do you, how do you think about uh, story and game design and how to balance in the, game, uh, in the design of the game? Well, I don't like story in games at all, very much. <laughs> um, and and this, this makes me different from a lot of people. I'm sure it's the same here, but in the US, so many people at conferences are like, stories in games are amazing. They're, you know, companies say, we're gonna find new ways to tell stories with technology. And I just, I, you know, I don't think most games have good stories. Uh, so I don't, really, I don't really work in that direction. Um, if you like game stories and you're excited about it, then I encourage you to, to do that because um, it's only by working on that problem that we can make things better and better, right? But for me, um, and again, this is my personal style, it's not how I'm saying anybody else should do it, uh, but I focus on, okay, so there's, like story is a word that means a lot of things. 
Like if you read a book or watch a movie, there are many elements that you would call story. There's the plot, which is the sequence of events that happen. But there's other things. There's setting, you know, where it takes place. There's mood, which is how it feels. There's characters. Um, there are, I don't know, a bunch of other things. Um, really the part that games are not that good at is plot because games are interactive. And when something's interactive, you don't know what's going to happen. And when there's a good plot, you do know what is going to happen. So I think maybe we should research using those other elements of story as effectively as we can. And so when I say I don't like story, that's maybe even an overstatement. I don't like plot in video games. Thank you.